All right, this video covers confidence intervals for the difference between two proportions. So the idea is very simple. We have two separate proportions from two totally different samples, okay? So let's talk about this for a little bit. The idea here is fairly simple. We have two separate populations, right? And we want to compare the proportion of something within them. So maybe we have uh, the proportion of kids at Twinsburg who are absent versus the proportion of kids that are Solon that are absent. So we have two different populations, Twinsburg and Solon, and we're looking at the proportion of people, kids that are absent at each of these places. So again, that's kind of the idea. So to compare means um, what to compare means to look at the difference, right? When you're talking about comparing two things, you're looking at the difference between them. But you have to keep in mind that we're talking about samples. So the difference that we see between two samples might not necessarily be the true difference. It's just two samples, right? You know, one sample could vary, the other sample could vary, and you might not always see the true difference. So the idea is we want to build a confidence interval to look at that true difference. So the confidence interval is very, very simple. We take... Um, you know, we start off by saying, okay, hey, you know what, what was the difference that we saw, right? So we have our first samples difference, right? And then we subtract the other samples um, pr proportion, right? So we have what we call, it is an ob observed difference, right? This is the difference between the two proportions we saw. And then we're going to plus and we're going to minus a margin of error. And that margin of error is a combination of a Z star times standard error of the difference, standard error of the difference. And finding standard error of that difference is going to be a little bit tricky, but I'll explain as the video goes on. All right, so before we can actually move on, let's make sure we still understand what a sampling distribution is, right? A sampling distribution tells us what does our sample look like compared to many, 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 many other samples. And it's a very simple idea is that we may see our sample's difference, but it doesn't mean it's the only difference. There could be other differences based on other samples. And that's the idea, right? Now, we do know that we have to check our conditions, which we're going to hear, and they're going to sound very, very familiar. We've heard those conditions before. And we also know that um, provided there are 10 successes and 10 failures, we will be able to use the normal model. So let's look at an example so we can truly understand this. Now remember, what do we need to build a normal model? We need uh, the mean or the, I'm sorry, the average or the expected difference, right? So this is the expected difference. What do we expect the difference to be, right? How do you find that? All you got to do is subtract your two differences. It's, I mean, it's that simple. It's so easy, right? And then there's a standard deviation. What do we think the standard deviation of that difference is going to be? Now, this has a little bit tricky formula, right? First off, let's talk about the first sample. The first sample's standard deviation is the square root of P1 times Q1 divided by N1. I'm just using the ones to represent the first sample. So this is the standard deviation form that we've been working with. Now we have another sample though. We have P2, Q2 divided by N2. That's our second sample standard deviation. Now we're not allowed to add two standard deviations together. That's one rule that we've definitely learned. What we have to do is we have to add their variance. So let me square this guy and then square this guy. So if I square the standard deviation formulas, I get variance. Then I'm going to add that together. Now what happens when I square square root? Well, the square root goes away. This is awesome. This is easy, right? Okay, now this is our total variance, but now I have to put a giant square root around all of that to get back to standard deviation. So when we're talking about the difference, how do you find the expected difference, right? Mu is the expected difference. Well, you just subtract your two proportions. It's easy. But how do you find the standard deviation? Well, it's a little bit of a different formula. It's a giant square root around P1, Q1 divided by N1, well, I almost wrote a 2 there, N1, plus P2, Q2, divided by N2. And hopefully you know where that formula came from based on my explanation over here. All right, so let's look at an example using those formulas. All right, you read a report that 5% of Canadians are illiterate and that 7% of Americans are illiterate. In a sample of 1,005 Canadians and 1,015 Americans, what could the difference be? Well, the first thing is thinking about what should the difference be? What should the difference be, right? If I look at any two samples, the difference should be 2%, right? Because um, Americans, 7%, minus Canadians, 5% is Americans, sorry, 
for saying it, are supposed to be 2% more illiterate than Canadians. I and mean, that's just what should happen. But samples vary, right? So we might not necessarily always see that difference. We might see a little bit of a higher difference. We might see a little bit of a lower difference between samples. So that is where standard deviation of the difference comes along. And like I said, this is going to be a unique formula. It's a giant square root. Okay, so let me do Canadians first. Canadians were 5% times 95% would be Q. Divided by our sample of Canadians was 1,005. Plus, the Americans were 7% times 93% or 0 0.07 times 0.93 divided by 1015. So that is how you find the combined standard deviation. Basically, I'm finding the standard deviation for each Canadians and Americans, squaring it to get variance, but that makes the square root go away. Add all that variance together, square root to get back to a standard deviation. All right, let me show you how I'm going to type this into the calculator. It's actually really easy as long as you use parentheses. So giant square root. Now I need a small set of parentheses inside for the Canadians, 0 0.05 times 0 0.95 divided by 1,005, close that parenthesis, plus now another set of parentheses for the Americans, 0 0.07 times 0.93 divided by 1,015 Americans, close that parenthesis, hit enter, there we go, 0 0.0106. <coughs> 0 0.0106. Okay, so what's happening here is that here is my normal model. How do I know it's normal model, by the way? Well, let me just run through the conditions very, very quickly. Both samples must be random. Both samples must be less than 10% of the populations. Both samples must have enough success and enough failures. With 1,000, 5% of 1,005 and 7% of 1,015 is definitely enough. It's, it's close, but it's definitely enough. There's more than 10 successes and more than 10 failures. And there is one more condition when you're working with two samples. It's that the two samples meet, need to be independent of each other. And all that means is that if an American is illiterate, that's not going to affect a Canadian's chances of being illiterate or not. So when I make my normal model here, right smack dab in the middle, I'm going to put 2.02, because that's the difference I expect. But that difference could be a little bit higher, or that difference could be a little bit lower. Now, to be honest, for the sake of using this, I'm just going to round this to 0.01. It's actually going to make this really, really easy. So this could be 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05. This could be 0 0.010 and negative 0.01. Now, this is actually kind of really interesting to talk about. I plan for this to happen. And that is that anything in zero is actually a really interesting number. Because anything above zero is Americans are more illiterate like they should. So Americans could be anywhere from one, two, three, four, five, you know, it would be really weird to see Americans be 5% more illiterate, but it could happen. Now, anything below zero actually goes the opposite way, where Canadians would be more illiterate than Americans, because a negative difference, if I do Americans minus Canadians, it's a negative difference, and that means the Canadians were more illiterate. So it's important to understand that that's how this works. This shows you what should happen. Again, it should be 2% more illiterate for Americans, but it could deviate in a sense where it goes up or goes down. All right, let's take a look at a full problem now where we are forced to use a confidence interval, and it makes this problem really, really simple. In a sample of 110 peanut M&Ms, 22 are orange. In a sample of 150 regular M&Ms, 45 are orange. Find a 95% confidence interval for the difference of orange M&Ms between the two types. All right, so let's see here. The first thing i got to do is i got to check those pesky conditions. Okay, I'm just going to kind of say them out loud and check them off. They both must be random samples. The 110, 150 must be less than 10% of their populations, which I'm assuming is true. And I need more than 10 successes and more than 10 failures. I did have 22 successful orange. Common sense tells that there's going to be enough failures there as well. 45 is obviously also more than 10, and the failures of the remaining 150 would also be more failures, more than 10. And the last condition is that fourth condition when you're working with two samples, and the two samples must be independent of each other, meaning the outcome of a peanut M&M cannot affect the regular M&M, which should be true. Now, second is I really just need my work. Now, the first thing I need is an observed difference. Let me kind of get everything organized here. So, my observed difference for, uh, I'm going to use a um, P 
E-A-N-U-T. The observed difference for the peanut M&Ms was 22 out of 110 orange M&Ms. 22 out of 110 is 0 0.20 or 20% orange. And the proportion of, I'll use regular, R-E-G-U-L-A-R, -E the proportion of regular M&Ms I found was 45 out of 150, and 45 out of 150 is 30% or 0.3% regular. So, the observed difference is 10%. I observed a 10% difference between them in favor of more for regular, right? So my confidence interval is going to start off with that observed difference. And it's going to go up and it's going to go down by a margin of error. Okay, first thing I need is I need a critical value. We call that a Z star, a Z score, right? So for 95% confidence, how do I find this? Well, we should know it by heart, 1.96. Do an invert norm of 0 0.025, the bottom 2.5%, and I get that critical value of 1.96. That's very, very easy. Now back here is my standard error. Well, here's how I'm going to calculate the standard error of my difference, right? The standard error of my difference. Well, <coughs> Giant square root. Let's talk about peanut M&Ms first. That would be 0.2 times 0 0.80 divided by 110. So that's P and Q for peanut M&Ms divided by 110 peanut M&Ms plus 0 0.30 times 0 0.70 that's P and Q for the regular M&Ms, divided by 150. Now, why am I calling this standard error and not standard deviation? Because I'm using sample values. The 0.2 and the 0.3 was not necessarily true. It was just what my samples showed. So that's why I have to call it standard error. So again, giant square root on my calculator. Stand inside that square root, a small square root for 0.2 times 0.8 divided by 110. Close that parenthesis off. Next set of parentheses would be 0.3 times 0.7 divided by 150 M&Ms for that one, for the regular M&Ms, and I get 0.0534. So my standard error is 0.0534. Hopefully you could calculate that number as well. Okay, so multiply those two together, 1.96 times 0.0534 gives me my margin of error. So I get 0 0.10 plus or minus a margin of error of 0 0.1047. 0 0.1047. Okay, and now this is going to give me my interval. So take the observed difference of 10%, 0 0.1. I'm going to go down by 0 0.1047, and I get negative 0 0.0047. And then I'm going to go up by my margin of error, and I get 0 0.2047. Now, the trickiest and most important part comes now being able to interpret this interval. Step three, interpretation. I am... 95% confident the difference in the proportion of orange M&Ms is between negative 0.47% and positive 20.47%. Now, this means, i got to make sure you really comprehend what this means. This means that regular M&Ms, right, are going to have anywhere from 20% more orange candies to 0.47% less orange candies. Now, remember, I have no idea what the truth is. I know that there's a lot more positive to this interval than there is negative, but the truth remains, there could be no difference. The fact that zero falls in this interval means that there absolutely could be no difference. So orange peanut M&Ms and orange regular M&Ms could potentially be exactly the same. Whatever that number is, it could be exactly the same. There could be no difference. Now, that's why I have a negative on one side, meaning that peanut could have more, to a positive on the other side, which means regular could have more. I don't know who has more. This interval tells me that I'm really kind of like not sure. The fact that zero falls in this interval means that there could be no difference. Okay? And that's important to understand here. So hopefully this problem makes a lot of sense, and you guys understand the fact that zero happens inside of there and what that means. All right, see you in the next video.